programming models for scalable parallel computing. Um, yeah. So this, the, the presenters of this tutorial are uh, Ken Raffinetti, uh, Jan Fei Guo, and myself. Uh, all three of us are, uh, have been involved with, uh, with MPI for a long time. We are, uh, uh, as part of the MPitch implementation of MPI, and also uh, in the MPI forum, uh, I'm trying to, yeah, now I see, I wanna just, just a minute before I get, somehow it is not advancing now. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, we've been involved in MPI for a long time, uh, both in MPI standardization and MPI implementation. So uh, we hope to uh, share with you what we know. Uh, MPI is, is, is huge, so we are gonna cover some specific topics today. But if you have other questions or uh, anything, um, anything you'd like answered, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, you can ask in the chat, you can ask in the, in the Slack for this, uh, for this track, and we, we'll try to answer. Somehow this is advancing a bit slowly. Okay, so uh, we will assume that you have some MPI experience. So this is not an introductory uh, tutorial. Uh, we will focus more on understanding um, MPI concepts and how to improve performance, how to use the right set of functions and some, some of the more advanced features. This is not an introductory tutorial. Although some of the topics in, uh, in the morning are, uh, relatively introductory, but we want, uh, you know, we want to focus on performance even, even there. And we are going to, uh, we are going to have some hands-on and, and some examples uh, for you to work on. Uh, they, are, they are relatively simple examples. Um, they are not the best examples for the particular function that, that, might, that may be used, but it's a way of learning to use that function rather than uh, the, the best uh, use of, you know, best use case for that function. So we're going to use a a 2D stencil computation and, and use that same code, but do different things with it uh, uh, using different MPI functions. Um, and um, on the first slide of this, on the first slide uh, of this uh, presentation, you'll find a link uh, where you can download the examples, the, the zip file of it, and also, the, also this PDF. And you can find it uh, perhaps even in the at desk box, box folder. So in the morning, uh, uh, just a, a brief introduction from my, my end, and then Ken is going to uh, take over and he's going to talk about um, synchronization in MPI programs and how you may inadvertently introduce synchronization without, you know, without realizing it. And, and that can cause delays that propagate and, and that slow down your program and how to avoid those things. Uh, then there'll be some topics in, in collective communication and derived data types and and some simple examples to, to get started with, with that stuff. And then uh, towards the end of the morning part, I will begin with uh, one-sided communication or uh, remote memory access, which is uh, some advanced feature in, uh, in MPI. And we'll continue uh, after the lunch break with uh, one-sided communication, and there'll be some hands-on as well. Um, and then uh, Jan Fei will, will talk about hybrid programming uh, using MPI, which is MPI with threads, that, can, that is like MPI plus OpenMP, MPI plus shared memory directly, uh, which you can do, and also MPI plus GPUs, which is getting uh, increasingly important. And then we have a, a, a brief session about what's new in MPI 4 as well, which is a relatively new thing. MPI 4 just came out. And, and then there, if there is time, we can continue with hands-on. There are, we have more hands-on exercises than there is time for, so we'll do what we can, and uh, you can do the rest in, in your spare time in the evenings. And the solutions are also provided for, for the hands-on, so um, you, know, you can you can work work with them at your at your own pace. So just a quick introduction: what is uh, MPI? It stands for Message Passing Interface. Uh, the effort began in 1992, which is a long time ago now, uh, with uh, uh, sort of an informal group that called itself the MPI Forum. It's not in any official standards organization, um, such as ISO or uh, or any other thing. It's uh, it's informal. And, but it involved everyone who, was, uh, who had a stake in, in, in uh, communication interfaces. So they'd had the vendors at the time. Many of those vendors don't exist right, uh, right now, but the vendors keep changing. There were other uh, applic you know, users, application scientists. There were uh, 
researchers who had developed uh, portable parallel libraries and, and so forth. But the problem in, the, in, uh, in those days was that there was no standard API for communication, which was a problem because you could not write portable code or we could not write it efficiently. And if a vendor went out of business, you, you were left with a, with a program that you had written for that vendor's library that did not work with some other vendor's library. So uh, that was the motivation. And in 18 months, the first uh, 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 version of MPI uh, came out, MPI 1. And that still, uh, it, it provides the basic uh, communication functions that you would need, uh, the sends and receives and collectives and non-blocking communication and, and, and a whole bunch of other things. And many, many users are just use that uh, and, and they can get their work done. But there's a lot more and, and we'll cover some of that here. Uh, and something to note is that MPI is not a, a language or a compiler specification or something. It is, uh, and it does not also refer to a particular implementation or product. So MPI is this interface specification that's, that's specified by this MPI forum. There are many implementations of it. So wherever you're running, you're using some implementation of MPI. And if there's a, if there's a problem, something doesn't work or something doesn't perform well, it's usually a problem with that implementation. So you, you have to differentiate between the MPI standard and a particular implementation of MPI. Uh, so yeah, this is MPI one, which I, uh, uh, which I already talked about. Uh, then after uh, MPI one, the uh, MPI forum still continued to meet and they, they released MPI two. That was also a while back now, it was in 1997. And it added uh, features that were missing in MPI, the original MPI, such as uh, a whole chapter on IO, uh, how to do parallel IO from, a, uh, uh, from an MPI program. We won't cover, cover it in this to, uh, uh, today because that, uh, that, that itself is a, is a long talk, but at least some of it will be covered on Friday when, when there is the, uh, the, the IO and storage and uh, you know, the data session this Friday. Uh, yeah, MPI2 also added uh, a specification of how MPI interacts with threads. And we, we will cover that this, uh, this afternoon. And that was very important because uh, it, it defined uh, how hybrid programs could be written and, and could be written efficiently in a way that an MPI implementation could deliver good performance. Uh, the uh, the one-sided uh, remote memory access was also added there and it was improved in MPI3, we will cover that. And there were a bunch of other features. Then for about 10 years, the standard was stable. Implementations kept improving. Uh, uh, and then in 2008, there was a 2.1, uh, which was just uh, uh, bug fixes, errata, uh, you know, corrections. Then there was a 2.2 a year later, which had a, a few minor uh, additions. And then uh, the next major release was MPI3 that added several new features. And we'll, uh, I'll talk about that in a, in a slide. That was 2012. Then there was a, a 3.1 in 2015, which, which uh, also had some minor corrections, maybe a couple of new features. And the next big release that just happened um, now less than two months ago um, is MPI-4. And uh, we, we will talk a little bit about that later this, Jan, uh, uh, this afternoon. Jan, Jan Fay will, uh, will cover that. Now, everything about MPI is, is open. Uh, you can download the, the standard uh, from this uh, MPI forum website. Um, there's a lot of other information that you can uh, access as well, tutorial information and books and, um, and so forth. You can even join the mailing lists and participate in it yourself. There is no membership fee or uh, anything that some other organizations have. It is, it is completely open. Um, so what are the uh, new features in MPI3? Uh, it added uh, non-blocking versions of collectives and we'll cover that this morning. Uh, it added uh, something called neighborhood collectives, which is to do nearest neighbor communication, but using a collective function and to do it efficiently. I, I don't think we'll have time to cover that today. We, we, we cover it in different, in other tutorials, in our SC tutorial, for example, it, uh, we, we cover that. Uh, the, the, uh, MPI3 improved the one-sided communication interface quite a bit uh, compared to the MPI2. Major, major uh, updates there, and we will cover that in, in some detail today. There was an interface added for tools, that is for uh, debuggers and performance tools to be able to access some uh, features, internal uh, features of an MPI implementation or internal parameters and, and so forth in a, in a portable way. And uh, the bindings for Fortran 2008 were added. And there were a, a, a few 
smaller uh, you know, uh, features as well. Uh, MPI three also removed the C plus plus bindings that were that were added in MPI two, uh, but you can still use MPI from C plus plus via the C bindings. So MPI can be you know you can use it from C C plus plus Fortran for sure. There is even Python versions and and and, uh, and others, but officially at, you can you can call it from C C plus plus and Fortran means Fortran two thousand and eight or even earlier versions of, of that. And the reason these bindings were removed uh, was that the, 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 the people who created those bindings in the first place felt that they were not of the right, uh, the C++ flavor that, that C++ programmers want. Uh, they were uh, using the boost libraries instead, uh, you know, the, which had a more C++ like binding. So since they were not being used, they decided to, uh, uh, they, were de they were deprecated in an earlier version and then removed in this version. And so all the new functions that are defined in MPI 4, they, they don't have C++ bindings at all. Um, yeah, and 3.1 I added non-blocking collective IO functions. And this table just shows that uh, MPI 3 is uh, quite well implemented in the sense that uh, wherever you're running, uh, either on your, even on your laptop or on a cluster somewhere or any of the big systems, the, MP, the MPI implementation there supports most of these features, if not all of them. So you can apply what you're going to learn today, uh, wherever you run. And, and if you go back and uh, in your own application, you should be able to use uh, what you learn today. Yeah, so MPI 4, as I said, is official in June and the, and the new features uh, are uh, persistent collectives. There's something called partitioned communication. There's another feature called uh, MPI sessions that allows you effectively to call uh, a version of init and finalize multiple times in your program, which MPI previously uh, didn't let you do. You could call init and finalize only once. This is a way of uh, of, of doing it uh, multiple times, you know, for libraries and so forth. Uh, there are a whole set of functions uh, added to, uh, to enable large counts. Uh, and uh, so you can do sends with a count greater than a 32-bit integer or, or a C integer, uh, basically. And, and so there are a large number of functions added, but they, are, uh, uh, they have a suffix underscore C to, uh, uh, so it's like MPI send underscore C, which is the same as a send, except that it takes a count parameter, which is large enough to be greater than a, than a C uh, integer. And uh, there were some use cases for that. And uh, improvements to error handling and, and uh, topology awareness and, uh, and so forth. And we'll cover that later in the afternoon. Uh, some important considerations, uh, and uh, if you are an MPI programmer, you already uh, already know that, uh, is that uh, all the parallelism is is explicit. That is, uh, you as the programmer, you are responsible for thinking about how you are going to divide uh, your program into multiple MPI uh, processes, and, and that is how you're going to divide the data that you're going to that each process is going to operate on, and then each process uh, does its local uh, computation, and they will need to periodically communicate uh, because they don't have all the data that they need for their local computation. And that's where MPI comes in. And th there you have to think about how you're going to do that communication. You can do it in a, uh, in a, in a trivial way and uh, it, that may not be the best performing. So it, it, you want to use the right function for the right, right purpose there that will give you the best performance. And that's what we try to uh, cover in this tutorial is how to use MPI in a way that will give you good performance. Uh, so that's that. There is a, a whole bunch of uh, information online. You, uh, MPI implementations are also, a variety of them are um, available online. Uh, there are books um, if you need. Uh, the, the, first, the one on the left is, uh, uh, these are like tutorial books. Uh, the standard itself that you download from the uh, MPI forum uh, site, it, that's like written like, like a specification. It's, it's not the easiest to digest. It's more like a reference if you want to understand a particular parameter of a function or uh, it, it can get a little tedious if you just read it, try to read it like a book. Uh, so this is more easy to understand. The, the one on the left is for the, uh, I would say the basic MPI one type of functions and the one on the right covers MPI two and three type of uh, functionality. 
And if you're interested in, uh, pa uh, in parallel programming models in general, there is an edited uh, uh, book, uh, it's a collection of chapters written by different people uh, that covers a whole range of parallel programming models. So it's all in one that uh, if you're interested in the topic, uh, this is a, a good book for that. Uh, so as I said, uh, the approach in this tutorial is a, we use a running example uh, throughout the tutorial and there may be smaller examples here and there for, uh, for specific uh, features. And yeah, is it? Yeah, so uh, maybe I hand it off here to either Jan Fei or Ken, who is who's gonna, will cover this slide. And, and then Ken is going to uh, talk about the next uh, part, which is the cost of unintended synchronization and collectives and, and derived data types. And um, yeah, if you have any question, uh, ask it on, on, the, on the Slack perhaps, and even on the, on the Zoom chat, but two windows are harder to, uh, to monitor and we'll try to address them. When I'm presenting, I, I can't see the uh, questions. So if there, if there are any questions, can somebody uh, call them out? Probably not in this uh, easy stuff. We're, we're kind of we're answering questions as we go in. Okay, good, text. okay, good, so, um, okay, good. So I think things are, yeah, people are getting responses there. Yanfe, if you want to jump in and explain the, the environment slide, yeah. please go okay. ahead. Um, yeah, um, I'll just quickly talk about uh, the environment that is available for this tutorial. And apparently since this at the past uh, tutorial, um, you can use the ALCF resource. We have a reservation on Cooley for the, for the purpose of this tutorial. Or if you prefer um, to keep trying some of the, some of the uh, examples uh, even after the tutorial, there's a Docker image that contains uh, M M MPI implementation and, and the examples uh, that we use in the tutorial. So you can, you can get it uh, uh, at, by doing a Docker pool from uh, PMRS uh, slash MPI dash uh, tutorial. So, so this, this one is uh, available to everyone who want to try out. So uh, if you have, a, have Docker installed, uh, uh, regardless whether uh, it's, a, it's a Windows machine or Mac or Linux, you, you can use this uh, image for, for trying out uh, MPI and our examples. Yeah, and uh, if you have MPI installed on your laptop, feel free to use that as well because our examples today don't need high performance or anything. It's more uh, for you to learn how to use some some MPI features. And of course, feel free to use the, the Cooley resource as well or any other resource uh, that you have access to. Uh, keep the slides uh, handy that were presented on, on Sunday, J-Hook, uh, had a getting started uh, uh, talk on, on Sunday. And uh, yesterday there was no hands-on, so you may have already forgotten what, was, uh, what he had uh, presented that day. But just keep those slides handy if you want to use any of those resources. Okay, so at this point, uh, Ken, should I stop sharing so that you can drive from your, your end? Yeah, that, that would be good. All right, let me try and share here. Okay, how's that? Are we seeing the slides? Not yet. Not yet, oh, I didn't hit the button, sorry. There we go. All right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, thanks Rajiv. So uh, as mentioned, I'm Ken Raffinetti. I'm a, a software developer here at Argon, um, primarily working on MPI. Uh, I participate in the MPI forum. So I'm uh, <clears throat> pretty familiar with um, the standard, what's going on in the standard, why, why things in the standard are the way they are. At least I hope I understand that. And uh, so we're gonna we're gonna take you through um, some topics here. Like Rajiv said, we're not uh, this is not fully introductory. We assume some background knowledge. So um, the first topic here we're gonna talk about is costs of unintended synchronization. So um, basically, what we're uh, we're assuming you kind of understand. Uh, uh, the concept of blocking send and receive, blocking point-to-point -point operations um, in MPI. So if you've you know written a hello world program or something uh, slightly more complex where you you know send send some data from from one process to another, um, 
that's great. You understand kind of the concept of, of uh, how to move data, how to identify uh, processes, uh, how to identify messages, you know, via uh, communicator rank tag uh, message envelope. Um, so, so with that basis, we can kind of start moving into uh, some more slightly advanced topics, rules of thumb to know when you're writing MPI in your application, um, and what, what things you might want to do in order to kind of avoid, uh, like we say here, uh, uh, unintended synchronization. So, so we, we, we're talking about this in the context of, you know, maybe you have some hot spots in your code where, you know, you, it's not, you don't expect those parts of the code to suddenly be, you know, slowing down your application. Um, so we're going to use a grid, uh, grid exchange pattern kind of here is the example um, throughout the tutorial. Um, where, uh, uh, you know, we have this, uh, like we, like we talked, touched on the stencil computation, we're going to be uh, exchanging data with our neighbors. And, and uh, yeah, so we're going to look at how kind of, um, you may end up with some unexpected hotspots if you just kind of used the uh, uh, blocking send receive constructs that you that you kind of learned when you first heard about MPI. Um, so this is this, this uh, slide shows, you know, an illustration of of uh, exchanging data on a mesh. So each, each of these blue boxes here represents um, an MPI process and the arrows are um, data exchanges. So, so you can see, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, hopefully you can. Um, so this, this process here is gonna exchange NATO with its neighbor to the uh, uh, neighbor below and neighbor to the right and, and, and so on and so forth. And we have a couple of uh, interior processes here where they're gonna be exchanging data in, in all four directions, up, down, uh, left, and right. And so um, this is, this is a, a, a sample code, a kind of a trivial um, or naive implementation of how you would do this data exchange. This is, this is basically pseudocode. It's written in kind of a Fortran-ish um, uh, Fortran dialect here. Actually, it might be valid Fortran. Um, and so uh, this is doing it with blocking, uh, um, blocking MPI send and receive constructs. Now there's a problem with this code. As you see, the first thing it does here is um, you're doing a loop over my neighbors, you're calling MPI send, and then you do a loop over your neighbors again and you call MPI receive. So the problem here is that this code might deadlock. Um, and, and the reason it might deadlock is that all of your sends, again, you're using blocking send here. And, and when we say blocking, that, that's really kind of a, um, it has kind of a, a, a special meaning in the MPI uh, context where, you know, if it, it, your send in this case, it may block, quote unquote block, um, until, you know, the, the target process, the, the receiver process, has actively started receiving the data. And so if you look at uh, our example here, well, in, in program order here, all processes are starting their sends first. And um, so it's entirely, it's entirely possible, it's valid for an MPI implementation for, all of the, for, for each time you call send to wait until the receiver is ready to, to receive the data. Let me see if I can silence my Slack here because that is quite distracting. Um, <laughs> let's see if I can figure out how to do this really quick. Sorry about this. I was not anticipating uh, audio and video. Oh, shoot. Notifications. All right. Disable all notifications. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> um, so where was I? So, so it's entirely possible that an MPI will wait until the receiver is ready to, to receive your data. So if everyone is trying to send um, and, and that's preventing everyone from starting to receive operations, then your, your application might just deadlock and everyone's waiting to send. Um, and you can, you can easily test this out. It, 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 this is especially true for, for large messages with, uh, in MPI where message is large enough where internally the library is not going to try and buffer it um, for you, it's actually going to wait until the receiver is ready. And so you can see that, oh yeah, if I, if I have enough data and no one's there to receive it yet, 
um, then my my application will just sit there and wait, um, and they wait indefinitely. So, um, so we have we have a, a partial solution to this. So we have uh, 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 we have a branch here. If we can solve this deadlock problem, if we add a branch to say, you know, if I have a down neighbor call MPI send, if I have an up neighbor call MPI receive. And what this does is it avoids the deadlock because all of the uh, processes at the bottom of the, of the mesh or the grid that we showed um, will now uh, start by receiving. And so the, there will be sender processes that are sending down will you know, have a receiver ready to receive their data. Now, but this is still using all blocking operations. So it kind of, uh, 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 kind of creates a sequence for how all of the send and receive operations are going to uh, are going to happen in time, and so that's that's what we're trying to illustrate on the next slide here. So um, this is uh, so this this illustration here kind of goes down in time. Uh, uh, it goes down in time. So at, at you have all these processes at the top here starting their uh, send operations, and then you know at least one or maybe more, uh, uh, likely more processes will start their receive operations. And you can kind of see that as, as processes, uh, you know, as data is sent, then this, you know, this process completes its send with this receive here. And so then it's able to uh, start its receive, which matches with the receive on another process and so on and so forth. Things kind of get unlocked and, and received and that frees up uh, you know, processes to kind of do uh, additional MPI uh, message passing as as uh, as things kind of uh, go through the sequence here. Um, but this is bad. Still, this is this is going. You know, this is basically doing uh, uh, send and receive one at a time when um, uh, when when we can probably do better than that. You know, the hardware and the and the and the software on the system can usually handle more than one operation at once. So, so how can we kind of uh, enable that in our application? How can we prevent this se sequentialization from happening um, in your application? So, so fix number one, we're gonna go through a couple of fixes here. Um, fix number one is just use non-blocking operations. And so non-blocking operations, um, whereas before with MPI send or MPI receive, so we'll just, uh, we'll just think about MPI receive in this case, because that's what this fix is uh, uh, related to. So I'm gonna let this emergency notification finish in the background here. Okay, so, so blocking MPI receive, you call, the, you call the library function, it waits until the data uh, is it, populated in the buffer here. So the buffer in this case is your in edge array uh, uh, element in, in, this, in this particular call. In blocking MPI receive, when, when control is returned back to the function, the buffer is ready to be consumed. The data is populated into the buffer and, and your application go, go ahead and start using it. With non-blocking receive, you're essentially starting this operation. You're saying, here's my buffer, Here's how much data I'm expecting. You know, here's my name. Here's who I'm expecting it from. It has this tag communicator, and you get back a request object. The I, the I and I receive stands for immediate. This this call essentially returns immediately, um, and your buffer, uh, uh, the state of your buffer is that it it does not contain the data yet, or or you cannot assume that it contains the data um, that's you know coming from from the sender process. In fact, you are not to touch the buffer um, until until you explicitly complete the operation later using using additional uh, MPI library constructs. So here, uh, the fix number one to kind of avoid the sequentialization we talked about is um, is to start all of your receives you know uh, before doing any sending at all. This way, all processes are ready to receive data. Um, when uh, when the sending actually uh, before they before they start sending data, and so that's that's what this example is illustrating here. But the bullet we have here at the bottom is this doesn't actually perform well in practice, um, and so we'll talk about why that is. Um, and sorry, yeah, I, I didn't I didn't call it out here explicitly, but this this wait all call 
um, here at the bottom. This is how actually we complete these uh, receive operations we started up here at the top. Um, so, so instead of uh, MPI receive, which is essentially a start and a, and a wait um, combined into one, this, this uh, I receive is kind of decoupled. You start it here and you complete it here. So after wait all is done, all of the uh, receive operations that you started, now their buffers are ready to be consumed. Now their buffers have been populated with the data sent from the, um, from the sender process. So why doesn't, this, uh, why doesn't this actually perform well in practice? Well, I mean, there's, um, uh, there's a couple of reasons, but basically, you know, you're still, your sends are still blocking. So, so if, you, if you look at your, you know, your send loop here again, your sends uh, are still potentially going to block. Um, and so you're only doing that, you're kind of sending them one by one. Um, and this is, uh, again, not really, not really desirable. It's better that you kind of, again, tell, the, tell MPI, I have all these messages to send, you know, go ahead and send them as best you can. And you can't do that if, if you're kind of, if MPI doesn't know that you're gonna be sending again, right? It's, it's just waiting for you to, you know, issue one send operation, complete it, issue the next one, complete it. Um, and so this is, again, this is better. This is better than the sequence we showed before where it's, I don't know, eight, nine steps or however many it was. Um, now, now this exchange can kind of happen in, in four steps. Um, and we have an illustration of this here. So um, we have essentially, you know, the sends going to down neighbors and then for processes that don't have um, don't have down neighbors, they might be sending to right neighbors. If a process doesn't have a down or a right neighbor, it's gonna to send to its up neighbor. Um, and so we kind of take you through the steps here of how this would actually kind of uh, um, occur in practice. So I guess it's actually six steps. That the, we, the four steps I think is the ideal case. Six steps is, is this kind of uh, less than ideal um, case we're, we're illustrating here. And we have a timeline for this. Um, and so this is uh, this low resolution graphic uh, that we captured a long time ago is, is, a, is a real world illustration of, of how, um, you know, uh, uh, I, uh, using non-blocking receives and blocking sends kind of works in practice. And you can see that, you know, process one here uh, straggles quite a bit. Um, you know, and, and but you can see kind of the, the blue boxes here, you can see some of these send operations take quite a long time um, and they're all happening in sequence here. So they're, they're kind of in control of the, uh, uh, of the timing of this, of this particular data exchange. Let me take a pause here to just see if there's any uh, questions I'm missing or uh, I don't think I can see the Zoom chat when i'm sharing um yeah we are uh, we're taking care of the questions okay good all right so uh so yeah this is again um another low resolution graphic but again we're just trying to illustrate that you know some of these sends end up taking quite a bit longer um than you know then then even just the same type of you know this is this is supposed to be showing uh, all of the different send operations. I think each bar is just showing the duration of each send operation in the in the in the trace that we captured before. Some sends take you know complete almost immediately. Some take take you know eight ten times as long to complete. And that's not really you know that's that's at, that's not because the, we're sending more data or the or the processes are slower or anything. It's it's really just because there's this unintended synchronization happening because you're using blocking operations where you're, you're kind of waiting for things to happen when you could be doing more work, more useful work um, kind of in, uh, uh, in tandem. So, so yeah, why the six steps? Again, I, I, I think I kind of tried to explain this here, but yeah, you're, you're, waiting, you're waiting for things to complete when you don't need to be. You could be kind of utilizing the extra bandwidth, uh, the available bandwidth on the, on the system. And you can think of this even if you weren't using MPI, if you were just using shared memory, and you know, and you were you were using memcopy. Memcopy is a blocking operation too. So you you, if you're copying data uh, uh, using memcopy uh, and waiting for it to complete before you use memcopy again, you're probably waiting 
you're probably wasting available memory bandwidth in that sense. Um, so that's just, a, you know, that's another example of, of why this is this style of, of synchronization is probably bad in your application. So fix number two here kind of takes it another step further. And instead of, uh, instead of just starting your I receive operations uh, ahead of time, also starting your, uh, uh, your send operations using MPI I send, this is the non-blocking version of MPI send, returns essentially immediately. Um, and uh, uh, again, your buffer here, whereas with blocking send, your buffer here is immediately reusable when, uh, when you use a blocking operation because the data has been essentially, you know, MPI has taken that data and either buffered it or transferred it to the receiver process. So it no longer needs uh, your buffer. In the case of non-blocking send, MPI I send, MPI essentially uh, uh, now knows about this buffer and is allowed to touch it allowed to read from it um, uh, whenever, uh, whenever it needs to, as long as, the, as long as it's not completed by the user. And, and the completion here happens at the, at the wait all step. So now we're doing our I receives, we're doing our I sends, and we're completing them all in the same uh, wait all call here. Um, and we'll illustrate here on the next few slides uh, why that's a good thing. So again, the, now, now our mess exchange is happening in, in a more ideal uh, four steps where everything is inter, interleaved. So if you're, you know, before we call MPI wait all, all of these exchanges are started um, by MPI, right? The application, you know, is, has called into the library to say, start, please start this data transfer and MPI knows about it and can start it. Um, and then we complete them all. We, we wait for them all to complete at the same time. And uh, again, this is another uh, trace application trace of uh, you know this style of um, this style of data exchange. In this case, we're using I receive and I send, and you can see you know the, the green and blue here. This is this is the uh, this is the duration of these immediate um, non-blocking calls. You can see that it's actually fairly small uh, for the most part where you're actually calling into the library and, and uh, starting these operations. And then the red boxes here at the end, these are the, these are, this is where you're waiting for the operations to complete. And, and the difference here between uh, the, last, the last graph here, here is, is when, when you're using blocking send, the completion is happening you know, uh, fairly inconsistently across the processes in your, in your grid, whereas, with the, uh, with the wait all, things are more or less happening uh, um, much closer together in, in, in physical, in wall time. Um, and, and you can see here that processes five and six, which on our, on our grid are these interior processes where they're actually making, um, they're doing the most communication they're, They have you know, four, four data exchanges to do they're the ones that uh, take the longest to complete because they, they, they have the most work to do. But otherwise, things complete relatively um, at the same time. And that's, that's a good thing. So, um, so the lesson here is uh, defer synchronization. Don't, don't use blocking operations because those, those involve um, a kind of an implicit synchronization. Um, and so, and, and for the most part, uh, that synchronization is more than is actually required from your application. So, so what we strongly encourage uh, people to do is use non-blocking operations and wait all to defer that point-to-point uh, uh, -point synchronization, you know, until the until the moment where you actually need to, you know, receive uh, or sorry, where you need to reuse your buffer, reuse your send buffer, or you you uh, uh, need to, um, you know. Uh, consume the data in, in, a, in a receive buffer. Now, the effectiveness of this strategy depends on how data is moved by the implementation. So just because non-blocking operations work great on one system um, doesn't mean they're gonna work great everywhere. But I think in general, that's, that's, this is a rule of thumb, I think we'll, you won't, uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll generally treat you well on systems. But, but for instance, if, if large messages are moved by uh, blocking uh, RMA or RDMA operations underneath the covers, 
Um, it's possible that you know an implementation uh, uh, where there's uh, where there's contention at target processes, uh, you know, or receiver processes, you might not actually see any benefit there. Um, but again, I, I, this is you shouldn't you shouldn't be seeing worse performance than using blocking send receive. Um, so I, I, I don't know if this is necessarily um, uh, something to be concerned about. We expect using non-blocking is just, uh, again, in general, not gonna be significantly worse um, than blocking operations. So that's why we kind of recommend, rec recommend using them in, in most cases. Um, but yeah, in, in, in general, with, with larger messages, the benefits kind of go down. If, if you're using, if you're issuing many, many small messages, non-blocking is, is generally gonna show good improvement with large messages you might get, uh, you know, the benefit might go down or it might approach closer to the, to the uh, performance of blocking operations um, in that sense. Okay, I see folks are answering questions in the Slack, so I'm gonna keep moving on here. I'm trying to get to, and I have a lot of slides to get to before the first, uh, uh, or the first hands-on, but yeah, so that, that's the idea of deferring synchronization. Hopefully that's that's uh, relatively cute, clear. Um, and we're gonna move on to the next topic, which is collectives, both blocking and non-blocking collective APIs uh, in MPI. Okay, so collective operations in MPI. Um, so unlike send and receive, which are uh, uh, calls that happen between you know uh, two diff two processes or 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 the same process because you can send to yourself, um, we call them point to point. This is an operation between a sender and a receiver. Um, collective operations are are called uh, uh, by a group, um, and all and those groups are kind of identified uh, using communicator the communicator objects uh, in, in MPI. Um, and so the, the idea here is everyone kind of participates in this operation collectively. Uh, and the idea, um, the idea is that these are fairly common um, communication patterns, uh, particularly in numerical uh, algorithms in, in scientific computing, such that you know, the, these, these collective operations in, in, many, in many instances can actually replace your send and receive um, you know, it, a, a point to point uh, algorithm that you're using to exchange data amongst your processes. So a couple of, of uh, examples of this, MPI broadcast, bcast or broadcast, you have one process, uh, which we call the root in MPI, distributing data to all others in a communicator, in a group. Uh, MPI reduce combines data is kind of the, the inverse of that. It combines data from all the processes in a communicator and returns it to one process. And we have, uh, we have some kind of graphical uh, in, uh, illustrations of this in the slides coming up. Um, yeah, so just some of the differences. Uh, so again, uh, collective communication is invoked as a group as opposed to between uh, a sender and receiver. Um, there's no tag. So if, if you go back to our send and receive APIs, you, kind of, you have this uh, integer tag argument you can use to um, identify messages, distinguish, distinguish messages from, uh, you know, by type using this tag, uh, uh, tag argument. Collectives don't have that. Uh, so you have to kind of distinguish collectives uh, differently using, you know, either communicators um, or, or some other way in your application. Um, for a long time, uh, the only collective APIs in MPI up until MPI 3 were the blocking operations. So, so you know, it's, it was like blocking send and receive you, if you started an MPI broadcast, when MPI broadcast returned control to your uh, uh, to your process, you know the buffer was ready. It either contained the broadcasted data, um, or or it or if you were the set, if you were the root process, you could you could reuse it. MPI was no longer uh, needing it, and so you can kind of loosely categorize the the types of collective uh, um, the types of collective communication APIs and MPI in these three categories. You have synchronization, we have data movement, and we have collective computation, which I'll explain um, as we go forward here. So the synchronization uh, uh, synchronization collective in MPI is, is fairly straightforward here. It's MPI barrier. Um, it has a single argument uh, communicator. 
And so this call, this is the blocking version of barrier. It blocks until all processes in the group of the communicator com, your input com here, have have entered into the collective, have called. So so if you know if you have a communicator with four processes in the group and three processes call barrier, none of them will leave it until that fourth process calls the barrier. That that's the idea. So once if 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 you if you call the barrier and, and MPI is returned control to your to your process, that means that every other process in that community communicator has called the barrier. We've all essentially synchronized at, at that point. Um, data movement API. So those are, again, the next category of collective. So we have, um, we have broadcast here. So the idea with broadcast, we have a root process here, which we illustrate as, as uh, P1. P1 has some data A in its, uh, in its buffer here. And it's going to broadcast that data to all other processes in the communicator. So uh, when you call broadcast, now, now P1 has data A in its buffer and P2 and P3 and so on. Uh, scatter is um, so it, it uh, whereas in broadcast, all processes get the same data at the end of the broadcast. In scatter, each process gets a different piece of data depending on its, its rank. It's, uh, it's identity in the it's, it's group identity in the communicator. So in this case, you know P0 gets uh, uh, the first piece of data. P1 gets the second piece of data B. Uh, P, P, uh, the third uh, P2 gets this third piece of data C. Uh, and so on. And, and gather is the inverse of this. So there's an MPI gather, which essentially again, all processes are, are uh, uh, sending a piece of data, to the, to the root process. Um, and, and so the root gets a different piece of data from all, um, all different processes in the communicator in its, in its uh, receiving uh, or output buffer here. Um, more data movement. So we have some, uh, you'll, you'll see there's a convention in MPI where some of the collective operations, uh, there's, you know, there's a gather operation. There's also an all gather operation. So as opposed to gather where only the root process receives uh, a piece of data. In the case of all gather, all processes receive uh, all pieces of data. Um, you can conceptually think of this as kind of a gather than a broadcast. Uh, and in fact, that's kind of the naive way to implement it. So you gather all data to a root process and then, and then broadcast it to, uh, to all others. And that's kind of how that works. All to all is is the most complex of the uh, of the all collectives. So this is kind of like a um, well, you can kind of look at you can kind of look at this uh, uh, distribution if 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 you're interested. But I think this is kind of like each process. Uh, this is kind of like a, a, a collective scatter where where each process is kind of the root of its own scatter operation, and they're all happening at the same time. Um, which if you look back at our scatter here, oops, if we're, you know, we have uh, process one distributing uh, uh, its data here in this buffer kind of vertically across processes, the same kind of thing is happening in all to all, um, just with all processes being, uh, uh, being involved as senders in this case. And then collective computation. So the third class of collectives, and, and uh, this is uh, uh, this this involves both uh, uh, data movement, but it also uh, involves a uh, an operation of some kind. So that's what's uh, uh, we're trying to kind of identify here by the F here. So so all of this data is essentially being combined, um, and there's an operation applied to it at the in this in the case of reduce at the root process. So if you want to say add up all of the, you know, if these are integers here, if you want to add those all up, you would use the MPI sum operator, and then the root process would get the sum of all the input or all, all the input data in a reduce operation. Scan does a kind of a partial, um, uh, a, a partial uh, computation. So the zeroth process compute may, may compute, uh, for example, the sum of the, of the first piece of data um, the second process gets the result of the sum of the first two pieces of data, uh, and so on. And so that's uh, that's kind of the the, the concept between uh, behind collective computation. Um, 
So this is just kind of a summary again of, of, the, uh, of the collective routines available, available to you in MPI. Uh, the all prefix highlighted in red um, uh, just indicates that you know, the results are delivered to all participating processes of the operation. Uh, the V versions uh, stand for, uh, uh, the V stands for vector. And so in, in, instead of all processes sending the same amount of data um, in, in an operation, V allows uh, different, different processes to send different amounts of data. Um, and you kind of specify this by having a, an array of, of, uh, of sizes uh, so that each process kind of knows how much data to expect. From, from one process or another. And then the, the, the computation APIs, your all reduce, reduce, reduce scatter, and, and scan take, uh, can take both built-in uh, operation uh, identifiers as well as user-defined uh, functions, which we cover here on, um, on the next few slides. So, um, so these are the built-in uh, computation operations that are supported by, by the collective uh, um, computation APIs. You know, we have uh, uh, simple ones, max, min, uh, product, sum. Uh, you can do logical and, logical or, uh, and as well as bitwise logical operations. Um, and then these bottom ones here are, are a little bit more complex. These are uh, essentially a combination of, um, you're, you're doing the max, but in addition to the maximum, say, integer value in a, in a collective, um, you get back both the maximum value and the location of the maximum value. That'll be the rank of the process that holds the, uh, the maximum value or, or minimum value in this case. So this is kind of a, a, a little bit more complex, but it's, it's, a, it's a pattern I think uh, many applications have. So it's something that, um, that FBI decided to add because it was, uh, um, worth standardizing, worth worth kind of providing in a in a in a built-in manner. As I stated, you can you can create your own collective computation uh, operations um, that that MPI can then apply to uh, um, can apply to collective data while it's uh, you know while it's performing the collective. So you use the MPI op create uh, API to do so here. Uh, you can and you have to free these operations later when you're. Uh, uh, when you're done with them, but basically you have a. Um, this is the function signature of of the uh, of the operation API. So it, it, you can just define a function in your code. Takes an input vector. Uh, uh, there's an in, in out vector for the results. Uh, you have a length here and a, and a data type supported by the uh, 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 you know that are data types that would be supported by these operations. Um, and so this is essentially what the user function should do: is it should uh, take the uh, uh, input data, apply the operation to it, um, and uh, and return it to the uh, uh, into the in out vector. User functions can be non commutative, um, but they must be associative, uh, so that you know this this just gives the, the implementation you, the implementation kind of uh, um, will use this information in order to apply uh, in, in order to apply the operation. Uh, so that it, it returns the right answer. So because again, this is MPI is invoking your your operation for you. So you just need to abide by the parameters of the uh, of the operation. So MPI doesn't you know apply it um, and get the wrong wrong answer at the uh, at the end of the operation. So we have an example of this. Um, this is a, a fairly well known example. This is calculating pi, uh, calculating the value of pi. Um, in parallel. And so the, the idea here is we're, we're doing just the, the sum of the area under the curve of, a, of, of you know, a quarter, uh, a quarter circle here. And uh, so the way, we, the way we calculate this in parallel is we essentially divide this up into, into you know, these slices and we assign uh, you know, uh, some number of these uh, slices to various processes in a, in a parallel computation. Each process is calculating its partial sum, and then we add all those partial sums together to get the value of pi. Um, and so this is essentially the code here. And the, the MPI parts of the code here are, are, are fairly, uh, fairly small. That, that again, because this is a, this is a common kind of um, 
pattern and numerical uh, numerical al algorithm uh, algorithms that uh, you know the, these constructs actually end up being you know quite powerful in, in what you can express. So in this case, um, we have this MPI broadcast here where we're telling all the processes you know how many segments you're uh, you're responsible for kind of calculating the uh, uh, the partial sum of and uh, so you know we broadcast that data out each process kind of goes through and, and does its uh, uh, does its computation here it, it goes ahead and adds up you know the the uh, area under the curve and then once it's done with that it's got the data and it's in this mypy buffer it goes ahead and says okay now let's all uh, you know I have my partial sum ready I'm ready to, to reduce this to, to sum this uh, sum this together with everyone else's partial uh, value. And this is uh, being, uh, so the, the reduce, the root of the reduce here is process zero. Typically root processes are process zero, but that's that's not required by MPI. It could be process one or, or process, you know, whatever. Um, and then once this reduce is complete, process zero says, okay, uh, this, is, this is my approximate pi value that I've calculated with all my uh, all my friends in this in this computation, and so yeah, we're we're getting close to the example here. But I, I'll uh, let me see if I can drop down into my uh, um, let me see if I can drop down into my terminal here and just show an example of this. Uh, all right, bring up my okay, bring up my terminal. Okay, so I'm doing. Um, I'm doing these examples on Cooley. Uh, this is a session I have open on the Cooley on, on the Cooley login node. So uh, as we stated, we have a reservation on Cooley uh, for this session where folks can run. Uh, uh, just in the interest of time here, I'm not gonna actually gonna submit to the job queue. I'm just gonna run this locally on my machine. Um, but I'm in, uh, uh, I'm in the examples directory, uh, as you can see here in the path. And uh, I'm gonna make the CPI, the CPI example. And so this is uh, using the MPI compiled wrappers. It's going ahead and, and building the CPI example. And it's uh, uh, the executable here is just this uh, uh, CPI uh, file. And I'm going to run this uh, using the MPI in the system using uh, a dash n here is four processes. I'm going to run this example. And you can see here that uh, you know, each process identifies its, its rank in the, in the communicator being used. Um, and they're kind of partially summing up MPI and, uh, and printing the results here from, from the root process. And so I can do this with four processes. I can do this with, with eight. Uh, the result is going to be the same because the, 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 uh, the example kind of adjusts the number of segments um, each process is responsible for calculating based on the, the, the size of the group and the communicator. Um, so you can do this you know, with as few as one process, but as many as you know, there are Kind of cores on the machine. Now, don't don't use all the cores on the machine to uh, to run the example, uh, at least not on the login node, so you don't kind of eat up all the uh, available compute uh, there. So, so that's the CPI example. Um, let me see if I can quickly go through non-blocking, um, and then we can kind of get to the first hands-on. Uh, so, let me change my share back to. Uh, sorry, let me change my share back to the slides. Okay. Okay, so we covered non-blocking point to point. Uh, we've covered blocking uh, collectives. Um, so as, as stated before, MPI3 added non-blocking collective communication. So this is, uh, uh, this is conceptually very similar. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so non-blocking send receive added, the, you know, the ability for you to kind of avoid deadlocks uh, or, um, and also uh, allows you to kind of overlap communication and computation at the same time. So you start your, you start your, you know, communication as early as possible. You go do some other work and then you kind of wait to complete that uh, communication when, when you absolutely need to, you know, when you maybe your work is done and you need something, something else to do. And so, yeah, the non blocking collectives are kind of a combination of, of both of this. And, and, and so what, what this ends up uh, giving you uh, um, in terms of benefits is that if you're doing non blocking collectives, it gives you uh, the ability to kind of um, 
be more resilient to system noise and imbalance. So if you have processes that, that are kind of, you know, uh, uh, kind of staggered in, in execution, then, you know, uh, being able to start, you know, that, that you're not necessarily waiting for other processes to enter into a collective. You can kind of start the collective and just wait for, wait for it to complete when you, when you need more work to do. And there's other semantic advantages here I'll, I'll cover in, in a later slide. Um, so all, all collectives in MPI have non-blocking variants. It's a, the convention is very similar to point to point where you have an I version of uh, broadcast in this instance. Uh, it takes the exact same arguments that broadcast did. It just returns a, a request at the end that then you use to, to complete the uh, operation later. Again, this function returns more or less immediately. It doesn't wait until the, until the operation is complete. Um, however, there's no guarantee of progress uh, for you know background progress of a started uh, collective communication. So we leave this as a, uh, in, in MPI forum terms, we call this a quality of implementation issue. Um, and so otherwise, it, it, if, you, if you need to guarantee that operation is making progress in the background, the, the only guaranteed way to do this is to call these progress functions such as MPI wait or MPI test uh, along with your, you know, if you're overlapping computation, just periodically call MPI test to see has this operation completed? If not, MPI knows that it's allowed to make some progress while, you, while you've called into the library. Um, the, whereas before with blocking collectives, you know, you start an operation that completes. Uh, uh, and so if you were issuing, you know, if you're doing multiple collectives, you kind of, you're only, you're only actually doing one at a time or you're completing them one at a time in kind of uh, in kind of program order. Um, with non-blocking, you can start a bunch at the same time, and they can kind of complete not necessarily in order. Just whenever you know, whenever the implementation kind of finishes, whatever work it needs to do to complete that um, complete that operation. So having more than one collective in flight at the same time is is uh, probably a good thing because you know not all uh, not all collectives will complete at the same time or in the same way. Um, but these have similar restrictions to non-blocking point to point where, you know, you can't touch your send buffers, your receive buffers won't have data in them um, until you complete the operation. Uh, one thing that's un, uh, somewhat different in, in non-blocking collectives, you can't cancel them. So MPI point to point, you can actually cancel uh, send and receive operations. We discourage you from canceling send operations for um, some specific reasons that I won't go into. Uh, but collectives, it's just disallowed entirely. You just can't do it. And, and that's really for a um, simple, uh, that's for uh, uh, implementation issues, not to put too much burden on, on MPI uh, developers such as myself to, to uh, allow cancellation of collectives. Another thing you can't do, which you can do with point to point is you can, you can match a blocking send with a non-blocking receive or a blocking receive with a non-blocking send. With collectives, you can't do that. Either everyone's doing a blocking collective or everyone's doing a non-blocking collective. You can't, you can't mix and match them. That's not allowed. Again, for kind of developer sanity. Um, so I'll, I'll, we don't have to go too into detail here about the, the semantic advantages, but again, this does allow some sort of progress in the background. Um, you're decoupling transfers from synchronization, which should give you resiliency to noise. Uh, you can have multiple uh, uh, outstanding operations. You can also allow overlapping communicators, which if you're if you're trying to kind of order your collective operations on multiple multiple communicators at the same time, um, you can get into tricky situations where you know you might accidentally deadlock because your process is trying to do a collective in one communicator, but it's waiting on the processes in another communicator are waiting for you to enter that one. So. Um, Overlap, non-blocking simplifies that situation. Um, another question that comes up in the in the context of non-blocking collectives is why is there a non-collect? Why is there a non-blocking barrier? How is this actually useful? Um, you know, barrier is for synchronizing processes. Um, what what's the non-blocking version give me? Um, so the idea here is that you start the barrier. No synchronization actually happens. Synchronization may happen in the background asynchronously, and and uh, um, and then you can you can absolutely synchronize here with with wait and test when you want to complete that barrier. Um, so the use cases here 
is you, you can overlap your barons, barrier latency, which you, know, you might get a small benefit from. But the, the more useful uh, uh, thing here is that you can, you can kind of split the semantics of the barrier. You notify uh, your, your entry into the barrier non-collectively. People, uh, processes can kind of enter in the barrier whenever they want, but they synchronize collectively. And so there's an advantage here. There, there's a really uh, um, a popular uh, algorithm, popular paper by uh, Torsten Hoffler from, uh, from ETH Zero, where, where it, through the combination of synchronous send uh, operations and non-blocking barrier, you can get kind of a, a really good uh, sparse, sparse data exchange um, that's, that's much, that performs much better in practice than say like an all to all or an all gather collective um, because it reduces kind of the burden uh, of, of, you know, uh, this, this, this is especially true when, you're, when your data exchange is sparse. So it kind of reduces the, uh, um, the work needed to do by processes that don't, don't have a lot of data to exchange. So bar barrier ends up being one of the most, uh, uh, actually one of the best, most useful non-blocking collectives, believe it or not, um, even though at, on its face, it seems kind of strange. Okay, so section summary, collectives, uh, obviously very powerful feature in MPI. They, they express kind of uh, a lot of things in a fairly similar or fairly, fairly simple, straightforward API. Um, they're optimized pretty heavily in MPI implementation. So uh, a good MPI has really good, they, they kind of, they spend a lot of time having really good collectives. Uh, things like algorithmic optimization. So you have tree-based communication for something like a broadcast. You have hardware optimizations becoming more popular now where you can, you know, collectives are accelerated in the network uh, or in a switch. Um, and yeah, like we covered, you know, non-blocking and, and uh, uh, these things match, match kind of your, your, uh, your application patterns. Okay, so I'm a little bit behind here. We'll try and get into this example here because this, uh, this is the start of the hands-on portion. Um, so we have this running example throughout the day. This is a stencil computation, which uh, hopefully a lot of people are uh, uh, fairly familiar with here. If not, there's a little introductory here of, of how, uh, how a stencil might be used. Um, but I'm just gonna go into kind of the more uh, uh, illustrations here to show uh, kind of what our example does. So the, the idea here is we have a mesh, each one of these meshes, uh, each one of these points on the mesh identifies, you know, an MPI process that has some data local to it. And it's gonna be calculating, um, in our case, it's gonna be calculating, you know, the heat, uh, uh, the heat dissipation in this 2D plane um, by, you know, exchanging its, its local value with its neighbors to the up, down, uh, left and right directions. And so this, this red plus here is the, the, the stencil. Um, and so how, how would you go about, sorry, I, I, I misspoke. Each one of these points is a piece of data. And then uh, uh, we're gonna use these red, these green um, lines here to kind of partition the data amongst MPI processes. So you can think of this as nine different processes, each responsible for you know, calculating the heat dissipation in this portion uh, of the mesh. And so that's how, uh, uh, that's how we're gonna go ahead and, and uh, uh, divide this work amongst our processes in parallel. And then for, for the borders here, the green, the green lines kind of represent the dividing lines. They're gonna have to be a data exchange, whereas all these uh, black dots in, inside the green are local to a process, so it, it doesn't have to do any you know, extra data exchange to, to, uh, to calculate the, the values. Across the green here, we're gonna have to exchange data with our neighbors in order to, uh, uh, neighbor processes in order to calculate the, uh, um, calculate the values at these, at these borders. So we decompose the data like so, you know, like I said, the green, uh, the green lines uh, delineate uh, the edges. Um, and then these values kind of represent, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the data at each process and also the size of those edges. Um, so I, we'll go into the, you'll see as we go into the code here, kind of how this is implemented. Um, one thing to note here, yeah, we use, M, uh, so for, for processes that are gonna communicate across these borders, um, they're gonna identify, you know, uh, 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 send and receive messages with the rank of the process that they're communicating with. 
for, for instance, here, a process at the bottom, which has no neighbor to the to, uh, uh, neighbor in the down direction, we're not actually gonna, uh, you know, we're gonna handle these as kind of a special case where instead of sending to a, a, a rank, we're gonna use this uh, special uh, value MPI provides called MPI proc null, which is essentially saying, um, this is, uh, 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 there's nobody there. I don't have a neighbor. I'm still gonna make an MPI call just be sure for simple, uh, you know, for, for implementation purposes, it's simpler if, if everybody makes the same amount of MPI calls, um, but some of them are essentially no ops, they're sending to nobody. Um, but this just makes it easier to kind of make your algorithm adjust to different sizes of processes and, and whatnot. Anyway, so that's something to know of. So again, data transfers uh, here, this process is gonna be exchanging data with its neighbor to the north because it doesn't have it locally. Um, and how we do this is we actually over allocate. So if this is the if this is the valid data in our process, we're going to over allocate our buffer to also include um, you know room for uh, data from what we call ghost. These are the ghost regions. So this this data actually comes to us from our neighbors uh, using our MPI data exchange. As a, as again we'll see in our in our example code. So that, that's just an illustration of how, how the data gets exchanged. The central process is sending its edge data to its neighbors, which then stores it in these ghost regions. And, and, uh, um, and likewise, they're sending their edges into the central process's uh, ghost region here. So <clears throat> you can find our examples in, in many places. Uh, if you downloaded the zip file from the link we provided or in the, in the box folder, um, the examples are also present on Cooley in, the, in this uh, NFS, in this network file system uh, 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 folder. We recommend you copy those to your own project directory if, uh, um, if you want to work with them locally on Cooley. You can also use the Docker container, as, as John Faye talked about earlier. Uh, if you want to run these on actual Cooley nodes, you know, use the, uh, use the uh, uh, at PESC project and the training queue. Uh, to use to use the reservation that we have for today. And so yeah, the, the first thing, uh, the first example we're going to go through is uh, looking at the um, uh, stencil with non-blocking send and receive. So if you look at the non-blocking point to point directory, um, this is how you would run the example. So again, this, this is an example Q sub where you uh, submit to the queue, you have a time limit to your job for 10 minutes. Uh, this is this is the usage of the um, of the example. So you you're going to compile here. Uh, you're you're going to compile your example. You're going to get back this stencil executable, and you can run it um, with a number of processes. And you kind of give these uh, you're going to give the domain size, the heat, the number of iterations, and then your your uh, the size of your mesh in the x and y directions. And here's just an example. So this is a 16 process um, example. You start with, uh, you have a thousand uh, grid points. Your heat source is 1000 here, which is just kind of an arbitrary value. You're gonna do 10 iterations um, and you're gonna divide your domain into four, four, X, uh, four processes in the X direction and four in the Y direction. And this is, this is, the, uh, this is what you should see when you run this example. This is the, the heat output, the heat value output. Um, and this is the time it took. And you can, you, can, you know, uh, no matter the size of your of your um, MPI job, the, the the value the output value should always be the same because you're doing the same amount of iterations, you have the same input values, but your time may vary depending on you know how many processes you use to, to calculate that value. Um, yeah, this is the Docker uh, uh, example, um, or this is the, this is how you use the Docker environment again. So I think yeah, I think we have um, looking at the uh, looking at the agenda here. So we have time here until 11 to kind of mess around with this uh, stencil example. Um, so I think, yeah, I think I'm just gonna uh, uh, leave it here for folks to kind of uh, try and get this running on their systems. Uh, at this point, there's no actual changes we intend for you to make to the code. I think we just wanna make sure you get it running uh, and you can kind of explore the code and see how, um, you know, see how it works 
see how the data exchange is done. You can kind of explore the, how, how MPI is used um, and ask questions if you're having trouble and, and, and uh, yeah, just kind of let us know. So yeah, we have, we have until 11 and then there's a 15 minute break. So essentially now for the next 30 minutes or so, just kind of play around with the example or uh, um, you know, get yourself something to eat or drink if you, if you need that. We'll keep answering questions on Slack. And I, I may have missed it, but did you actually go through the code? I mean, pop up the stencil.ca. Yeah, why don't explain, I, yeah. Explain what is, you know, what, what all the various things are in there or? Yeah, that's a good point. Why don't I, why don't I do that? Instead because of just... they, they need, they, they're going to muck around with that code, right? So they, they'll need to know what the various parts of that code good are. Point. Okay, let's, let's do that. Yeah, rather than just tell you to do it, why don't I show, that'll be, that'll be more useful. Okay, so. Hopefully this is visible. Not yet. Oh, let me, yeah, sorry, I didn't reshare. Great. Okay. So this is the stencils on yeah, can you Can you make it bigger, the font? I can make it bigger, yeah. How's that? Yeah, a little more. Let me see if, maybe just shrink the window size. Yeah, that's better. Can it be done one notch more? I'll keep going. Okay. How's that? Yeah, this is good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so let's go through this example. Um, so we have our main function here. Uh, so this is uh, this is a C example. Hopefully, folks are are more or less familiar with C. Um, and I'm gonna, uh, you know, we've kind of got. Uh, um, a lot of variable declaration at the top here. We'll kind of skip over that. Um, so first thing we do here, uh, MPI wise, we're initializing environment, we're calling MPI init. We're identifying uh, each process in MPI com world, which is the built-in uh, MPI communicator that encompasses you know, all the processes in, your, uh, uh, in, in this uh, execution. And then the setup function here is just going through, you know, it's, it's checking the input arguments. Um, so things like the size, uh, the size of your mesh, um, the, the input energy, the number of iterations, the dimensions of your, uh, of your decomposition. Um, and so that's, uh, that's essentially the setup phase. Um, the, the next thing here, we kind of determine our coordinates in the, uh, in the 2D uh, decomposition. So I take my rank and I kind of, you know, use the, use the, um, the sorry, the, the, the dimensions of the X and Y to kind of identify myself. So that's, that's what these RX and RY, uh, I believe, represent. And then we determine our neighbors here. So this is, this is a, uh, uh, Fairly complex, but just the, the short story here is basically, you know, we, we compute our north, south, west, and east neighbors. And we have, again, these special cases where if I don't actually have, um, if, I, if I, you know, I do this computation and I can tell, oh, I don't actually have a neighbor to the north. I don't have a neighbor in the, in the up direction. Then I'm going to use uh, MPI proc null as my north neighbor. Um, so then later on, when I go to make the MPI call, I don't have to adjust um, I don't have to adjust my code. I can just make the MPI call and MPI knows that this is, this is a no-op operation. Um, so again, more, more domain decomposition. This, this sets up the size, um, the size of your, of your kind of uh, uh, size of the data that, that each process is locally responsible for and, and the offset uh, uh, used to, to kind of go to the, the next patch of, of data. Um, again, this is just kind of a trivial example where, where, where you know, we have these heat sources. Those heat sources are going to be basically spread throughout the 2D plane. Um, and so that's what this kind of uh, uh, this init sources function is doing. Alloc buffs. So now we're actually allocating the memory. 
that we're that we're locally responsible for. Um, in this case, so that's what that's what BX and BY, and also so you have two you have two copies of this. Um, sorry, BX and BY are, are the are the input values. A old and A new are the actual arrays. So you have you have you have two copies because you're doing you know matrix multiplication here. Um, so you you have the old and the new values um, because you're going to be using those to kind of uh, um, iterate through. Um, and then you also have your neighbor regions here, which are also allocated by this uh, alloc buffs. So you have a send uh, uh, send to the north, send to the south, send east, send west, and receive to the north, south, east, and west. And it, I won't go with the, the details of this. You can kind of look at there, but that's kind of uh, just kind of uh, assume that's doing the right thing. Okay, so <clears throat> now we get into the actual iterations. So the iterations, uh, we're going to calculate. You know, our, uh, uh, our comment here says refresh heat sources. So basically, we we load up the uh, um, the A old array with our uh, with our energy with our heat kind of uh, um, how you want to call it. We our heat source over time. So each iteration, more energy is added. Into the uh, into the um, into this two D uh, plane. That's what this plus equals energy represents. Um, and then, since this is we're using non-blocking constructs here, we haven't got to the derived data types part. But I know folks are, are somewhat familiar with this from the uh, from the questions I saw in the hardware session yesterday. So uh, we're using send and receive, and we're dealing with contiguous data buffers. So so we're going to actually go ahead and pack data. Into our send buffers uh, from our um, from our a old here, and then we're going to do our data exchange. So we're going to start the sends and receives using non block non blocking operations. We're starting them all all eight at the same time, and then we're going to wait for all of them to complete here um, at the same time. So there's no there's no overlap here going on. Well, there's no computation overlap. This is we're just we're effectively deferring all the synchronization in this case by starting all of them at the same time and completing them all at the same time. So that's still that's still a good rule of thumb to follow as, as I tried to express earlier. Um, once everything's done, unpack the data we've received um, into, the, uh, into the receive buffers. We go ahead and update the grid. So this is where we, we actually calculate um, the new heat values. Um, Based on you know neighbor uh, uh, you know the, the stencil computation we talked about, um, so now now the now the new values of the heat at each at each point in the grid are are stored in a new, uh, and we're done with the we're more or less done with the iteration. So we're going to swap our a new into a old uh, so that we can we're ready to start the next iteration uh, when we go back to the top of the loop, and at, at the bottom here we see are we done if we completed all the iterations we, we talked about. If so, we, we exit out of the loop and print out the, uh, print out the results we saw in the, uh, in the slide. Otherwise, go back, go back and repeat. So that's the, that's the idea here. Basically, there's some cleanup here after, after the loop terminates, you know, all the iterations are done. Um, oh, sorry, that the, the print actually happens if, after this uh, all reduce once the loop is done. So, at this point, the, the, the data is final um, at each process. And then we use this all reduce uh, 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 call at the end to get a, to get a summary of, of, the, uh, uh, of the heat output and then gets uh, print, printed by the, root, by the zero process here before we, before we shut down MPI. So, so hopefully that's a good quick introduction. Uh, hopefully people have been able to kind of run this and, uh, and look at it a bit. Um, on their machines or, or on Cooley. So uh, yeah, we've got uh, a few minutes here before the break. So any, any other questions? If you wanna ask questions out loud too, that's fine, I'll try and answer, but it looks like things are going pretty quickly on the, on the Slack, so that's good. So one question is why are the I receives after the I sent? Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, I saw that question kind of come up um, as 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 uh, uh, as I was talking about it, so it 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 doesn't 
it probably won't matter that much in practice, but I, I would say that it's actually, it's probably good practice to post your receives um, first. That I, I would say this, this example is actually, uh, I, I would say kind of against uh, a good, good rule of thumb. So the reason, the reason it's good to post your receives first is that, you know, if you remember from the hardware track yesterday, they talked about how, you know, at the hardware level, or, you, or the below MPI level, you know, you have this concept of, of uh, your expected lists for expected messages, which are essentially receive operations that, that the hardware knows about. And you have your unexpected list, which is when the data arrives and there's no, there's no receive operation that's yet been posted. And so what happens when, it, when messages go into the unexpected list is they kind of, uh, um, they could incur extra copies. Whereas if the, if the receive is ready, uh, by the time the, the 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 send operation gets, you know, the send data gets to the uh, gets to the process, then then it, it it it's possible to avoid extra copies in that case. So I would say um, one thing we could change in this uh, uh, in this example is to post your receives first because that's in general a, a better uh, uh, a better kind of rule of thumb to go by. Post your receives so that you have a better chance of the send data. Uh, the send avoiding copies when it when it gets when it arrives at the receiver. Well, because these are non-blocking, there's no there's no there's no possibility of deadlock um, if you do do it this way. It, it'll still work. Can you make a quick note about the differences between the codes at blocking call versus blocking point to point, non-blocking call versus non-blocking point to point? So, so these are these are intended to kind of showcase. Um, and so, all these examples, at least the stencil uh, examples in these in these folders, are intended to kind of showcase the MPI features um, somewhat independently. Sometimes they build on each other, but the non-blocking one. I'm sorry, the, the, the uh, sorry, the, the, yeah, the blocking point to point would essentially be a, a fairly naive implementation where, where uh, you know, it's, it's again using, if all you knew about MPI was send and receive, then you can implement the example uh, using those calls and you can do it correctly and it would work, but it might not perform great. Non-blocking illustrates how the example can work, can perform better, can be slightly less cumbersome to implement because in non-blocking you can kind of you don't have to worry about deadlock avoidance. You can kind of just start all your operations and complete them and and and, uh, and not not worry about it. Um, the collective and the non-blocking collectives again just kind of build on you know here's MPI constructs that more or less can express the same concept um, but may have different different you know pr properties in practice. It may be it may be more more compact to express in your application using collectives, um, but uh, it, it might also perform better. It might perform slightly worse. So there's there's a trade off between you know expressibility and performance, um, and, and, and so that's kind of that's kind of the idea with with how how we've kind of uh, implemented so many different versions of the same example using different features. So, so in this case, yeah. So, so just to confirm, I'll answer this question. So, in in this case, the hands-on, this one's already done. Uh, when we get to the end of the next section, we're going to recommend you try to uh, modify the code to use a new feature. We have uh, we have the we have the answer already in um, in the examples directory. If you want to peek at it, you know, if if you've gotten to the end of the hands-on section and you kind of you want to see how you're doing if, if you if you did it right or or if you're just stuck and and uh, um, you know you want to move on to the next thing. So so the next hand on we will we will recommend you you try to use the new features to to modify the code and and kind of make uh, uh, make it work uh, uh, with those. Um, but there is an example there is an answer if if you want to just look directly at that too. So yeah, but but this one we're just kind of. Because we're going to keep using this stencil example throughout the day, just give you, give you a little bit of time to kind of uh, look through it, run it a few times so, so you don't, uh, um, you're not just like 
totally lost when we come back to it later and, and uh, ask you to start modifying it. Yeah, and you need need pay attention only to the communication parts of this program. Yeah. Because that's the, that those are the parts you'll be making changes to. Wherever there is a local computation, I'll just, just ignore that part. And it may not be the best way of solving this problem either from a numerical perspective. It's the MPI communication that that you're going to use different ways of doing that. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint for the for the next. Uh, so someone asked, uh, although it, I always lose the chat when I switch, but someone asked what what PX and PY are. So so in this case, PX and PY are the size of the x and y dimensions of your um, of your decomposition. So again, your domain size is how many points. Uh, um, uh, no, so, sorry. I think your domain size in this case is essentially the total number of processes. You know, it's it's. So if you have uh, in this case sixteen processes. Oh no, I, I sorry, I'm wrong. I'm looking at the example here. Domain size is the number of points, um, and then your your px and py are the size of the of the decomposition in, in each of those dimensions. So uh, in this case, we have sixteen processes. We're going to go four processes across in the x dimension and four uh, four processes in the y dimension such that you have uh, you've divided you've divided your domain into 16 uh, uh, subdomains uh, so each process is responsible for 1 16th of the uh, uh, of the grid of the of the mesh so you could also do something like 8 and 2 for example like you could make it not not a square kind of for decomposition. Yeah, they, they, it doesn't have to be equal. It just has the, the product of those two values has to equal the number of processes in order for the example to work. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and there were a couple of questions related, related to MPI proc null in the chat and in Slack. So I, I'll just, I, I'll just uh, clarify that a proc null is effectively a way to do a, uh, do a no op in it. So if you call M MPI send and, and uh, give the destination as proc null, it means nothing happens. The send doesn't happen. And the, uh, correspondingly on the receive side, if you call it receive with the proc null, it's like a, a, a no op. Uh, internally, uh, MPI uses a special uh, integer value that cannot be a, 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 a valid process number. So it, can, it, it could be a negative number, but a specific one that that MPI implementation understands. And it's typically used so that your for, so that you don't have any special case in your for loop, or you know, if you don't have a neighbor at the bottom because you are at the edge, then instead of having an if statement there, okay, if I am a process on at the bottom row, I don't have a neighbor below me, then I don't need to call MPI send. Instead of having that logic in your code, your 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 destination uh, uh, rank that you have computed, you just set it to proc null, and then you don't care. Everybody just calls their sends and receives with whoever they know as their neighbors are. Some of them will have real ranks and the, at the edges there could be proc null and, and then nothing happens there. 